uh, oh, I forget what it was. But at any rate, no, it wasn't FaceTime. It was um, uh, the one that went out of business. Anyway, um, but this sounded really interesting. And I, I had about an hour's worth of time at the end of the day, and I said, okay, I'm going to download this software and try it. And the first thing that happened, it says, your video card is inadequate. And it immediately crashed. But it told me I should order a new video card. MySpace, yeah, it was MySpace. And um, so I got a new video card, and a couple weeks later, I was finishing up a project, and I had a couple extra hours. At the end of the day, it was like Friday at 4 o'clock, and I logged it. I put the video card in, um, and lo and behold, it worked. And there I was in Second Life. And here I am walking around, kicking beach balls and getting 10 lindens so I could take a picture of myself. And um, I was on the board of AMSAT at the time. We, we were the amateur radio uh, satellite corporation. We are probably the biggest funder of uh, educational satellite building. You've probably heard of things like CubeSats. Um, and we started that whole thing. And um, I wanted to start an exhibit about that in Second Life. And the board said, don't you dare, because all they knew about Second Life was there was sex. And it would tarnish their image. <laughs> Well, there is sex, but it wouldn't tarnish your image, really, a lot. Uh, later on, I met Patio Plasma, and uh, she convinced me to build for the Exploratorium. And it turned out, Patio was actually one of my um, professors at MIT. <laughs> um, so that was kind of, kind of weird. Um, and then, uh, since I lived in San Francisco and I knew the museum really well, I began building exhibits that were in virtual worlds. Uh, but they were virtual world, world versions of real ones. And uh, eventually we started building ones that were not exactly uh, ever done in real life before. And that's what Patio looks now, like now. Of course, she looked like, um, I don't know. Uh, well, we, no, none of us looked like this when we were, this was 10 years ago almost, nine and a half years. So why do I build? Uh, well, the number one reason to build in Second Life is it's really cheap. In in real life, if you have to build an, a, a prototype type exhibit, it, it'll cost you a bunch of money. But here, it's really cheap, particularly because we build it in Lindens. And it's very important here because museums are always trying to find funding. And sometimes virtual reality uh, exhibits, prototypes, sell a lot better than balsa, wood, and glue. And in virtual reality, you can also find beta testers. And beta testers, beta testers, if you work from where I live, uh, are a bit more progressive than the grandparents who are just taking their three-year-old kid to, you know, grandkid to the museum. And why not build? It's a lot of fun. So the other reason to build science in Second Life is in real life, if you fail, you have to all start over. And most of the time, you destroy the exhibit. And you can salvage... You know, but in Second Life, you can salvage a lot of the parts, actually most of them. Usually the only reason exhibits fail is because of scripts. All the needed elements are here. There's a robust scripting engine. There's a physics engine. There's high-resolution graphics. There's lighting and shadowing and uh, all kinds of stuff that's going on. And it's pretty easy to cheat if you have to. <laughs> if you have to. And believe me, I've had to. Uh, by the way, is my, if my mic's too hot, let me know. I'll kind of tone it down. Um, so the first lessons were the amazing thing about Second Life was there was a lot of resources to help. The Ivory Tower of Prims, which is still here, I believe, and the Particle Laboratory. Um, everyone in SL before you had an opinion, and pretty much everybody would share what they had. No, uh, no one really understood all the bugs, but the wiki was good, and the bug database worked pretty well, so you could research problems that you were having without a lot of trouble. And there were no real tools, but there were some things like Notepad++, which is one of the best text editors around, and it still is around, and it has an LX, LSL function library uh, and syntactical uh, editing, so that works pretty well, too. And the other thing about scripting is it's hard, but it's instantly gratifying when things work. It's kind of like chocolate. 
So, my six rules for building exhibits. It has to fit the, uh, the museum's motto. And the museum's motto is, we are the Museum of Science, Art, and Human Perception. And um, when Opperheimer, Opperheimer um, started the museum, he, his number one rule was no dinosaurs. So we, we pretty much keep to that. It has to be good science because if it's not good science, well, it's not a science exhibit. Let's be, let's be honest about that. And it has no place in a science museum. It should be evocative because if it doesn't make you think, it doesn't deserve your attention. It should be educational um, because if it's not educational, it shouldn't be in a science museum either. It has to be interactive. If it is interactive, it's not fun. And most importantly, it should be unique and take advantage of everything that Second Life has to offer. And Second Life has a lot to offer. So let's talk about those six points. First of all, meeting the mission. Science, we can drop balls, we have wind blowing, we have explosions, um, and uh, both particle and physical objects. This happens all the time. Art, you have motion and color. And whenever, if it's organic, that's even better, because I'll be honest with you, organic uh, movement is the best. Uh, and perception. Per uh, illusions and apparent motion are really evocative. And physical properties um, that aren't necessarily the properties that you think they are. Good science. Physical exhibits should obey the laws of physics. Gravity must be considered. Natural properties, wind and tide, in, in Second Life, you, you may not know that we have winds and tides. They have to be accounted for. Material properties must also be set properly because, to be honest with you, there's an exhibit at the SPLO, um, which is the adjunctive uh, museum for Exploratorium, where I have different materials. You can set a bunch of balls to be rubber or glass or stone or metal. And you can see the difference in how they behave. If you drop a, a rubber ball, it bounces like crazy. If you drop a metal ball or a stone ball, it hardly bounces at all. So these are very important things. And sound also is, plays a big part of that, because if you have a rubber ball, it sounds differently than if you have a stone ball. Um, stone balls are good, though. I'm going to unclick here for a second, because I need to uh, uh, Yeah, even when we don't have a podium, we still need that little bottle of San Pellegrino um, halfway through the, uh, the exhibit. So, uh, the lecture. So, um, not all will be Earth physics. For example, I'm going to show you an exhibit that talks about other worlds. Sometimes you can take things and they're suspended in fluid. We have an exhibit at the Exploratorium uh, Sim called, um, it's, it's basically uh, uh, pollen. Uh, suspended in water, and uh, uh, I just blanked out on whose uh, who's property is this. But anyway, uh, you have to have, uh, you can do things like this, and you can also make things that are on a different planet, but you have to test. And, and, and I say this because um, sometimes things change. Um, collisions changed, and let me tell you, when collisions changed, it broke a lot of things. The most important thing is to be evocative in what you build. People in Second Life, uh, well, first of all, people in real life in a science museum will spend 60 to 100 seconds uh, scanning an exhibit. And the reason is they're walking by, and they're walking fairly slowly. And they're looking around, and they're also looking at other people. Um, so 60 to 120 seconds is about what you have to grab somebody's attention. In Second Life, it's about half that time because people are flying by um, and they're scanning the, with their camera and they may be looking farther out than you might expect. So you have to grab their attention somehow. Color is very important. Um, it's like flies to honey because if somebody sees something bright and shiny, they'll go check it out. If it's just a drab color, uh, they, they really won't. 
motion is is interesting. Sound is also helpful, but not so much because you know sound can be very uh, you know you have to use sound diligently, and it has to be tied to a particular uh, exhibit. And most of most importantly, it ha for me and for our museum, it has to be educational because um, the department I work for and that manages the Sims in Second Life is the Teachers Institute. We train teachers. That's our mission. And we design exhibits with uh, education in mind. Um, a lot of what do you see here type explanations, try to make the exhibits show concepts and allow for controls for people to change the parameters. And our attitude is all, all visitors are students. And this is a very important thing for museums. Um, and I mean this seriously. All visitors are students because they're there to learn. That's why people go to museums. Um, you might go to see a Rembrandt in the, in, you know, the Museum of, of you know, uh, in, in like the Rijks Museum is probably the best place to look for, for those. But you're there to actually observe and look and learn from that painting. Um, when I went to um, the Rijks Museum the first time and I spent hours looking at Van Gogh's, I learned, oh my god, so much about light and shadowing and just perception. It was amazing. So you have to do that. So the other thing is interactive. It has to be fun. We try it. I don't know how that happened. It restarted, but let's try to catch up here. Here we go. So we try very hard to allow people to interact with exhibits, and this is true in the real museum and Second Life. We st try, start with sitting on them. New Newton's Cradle, everybody knows what that is, but we built one that people can sit on and ride. And we have Newton's Cannon, and that allows you to orbit the Earth. And we have telemetry from the little cannonball that you sit on that tells you, you know, shows everybody else where you are. Um, you can control parameters like speed and light, shooting a bullet and splitting a card. Uh, I really wish I could have brought this one, but um, it's uh, the permission. It's a weird thing with the permission systems. I forgot to set them properly, and I, one of my alts built it, and so I got to go back and log in with her and change the permissions and all that stuff. But anyway, um, Edgerton's uh, card. I'm sure everybody knows what a slow motion bullet looks like splitting a card in half. And uh, you can also take different points of view. When somebody sits down on something, you can change where they look. And that's programmatically. Uh, pr programmatically. And um, that's important, too. Uh, particularly for uh, Newton's cannon. We had people looking out the barrel of the cannon. And that, that was really fun. Um, and then also there's just some things that we build that are fun. Um, we built. Foucault's pendulum, but we called it Mukao's pendulum. And you sit on it, and you ride the pendulum back and forth, and it knocks over milk bottles, and it spills the milk. So uh, that's why we called it Mukao's pendulum. Um, so you can leverage uh, Second Life to create uniqueness. And there are a lot of ways to create a unique ex ex exhibit. But it really comes down to imagination and experience. Uh, uh, the so LSL, which is the scripting language, is really robust. And they keep adding new functions all the time. So um, you really have to just go to the LSL wiki and really dive into it and get to learn what's there. Um, I'm, I've actually been kind of a slouch lately because I've been, I actually moved three times in two years, or two year, two times in three years. And so, um, I'm kind of a little behind, but there's a lot of stuff, and they've now finally put in JSON, uh, so that's kind of good too. Um, JSON's a lot better than lists, but I still use lists because I've always used them. Um, and pathfinding. Pathfinding is absolutely wonderful. Um, if you don't know pathfinding, learn it because it's terrific. My dog, which I'll introduce you to later, is pathfinding, and um, I have a pathfinding dog that I can give anybody who wants it called um, Boxer. 
And Boxer was my first uh, test vehicle for um, pathfinding. And uh, it's, Boxer is just a box, but it follows you around and it's cool. And you can actually have Boxer go upstairs and come downstairs and it teaches you a lot about pathfinding. And pathfinding is really worth knowing about. So, when do you break the rules about, you know, I gave you six rules that I have and when do you break them? Well, when there's something really important happening, I used up almost um, 2,000 prims building the um, Fukushima reactor and breaking it down into its individual parts. And uh, that was important. And even though it was somewhat of a, uh, a uh, static exhibit, which I don't normally like to build, we, ra we did a fundraiser and we raised almost $1,500 um, to go to Habitat of, uh, for Humanity in Japan. So it was worthwhile. Solar and lunar eclipses are very uh, big deals for the Exploratorium, so we always have exhibits for those. And, you know, if there's a science exhibit, we scramble to make up a, a you know, some kind of exhibit. March 14th, Pi Day 3.14. I'm sure everybody knows that. You have to break the rules for that, and most of those are static but fun. Um, I built an exhibit called um, uh, the... Uh, Let's see, what, are, oh, what was it? Oh, the, oh, I forget. Oh, my God. Uh, I built a lot of them, but um, I was going to say the pyre, the flaming pyre. But at any rate, um, you, if you go over to Exploratorium or the Splow, you'll see a lot of them. And the other thing that's important is that the boss says to do it. I mean, patio is... Uh, Patty is pretty pretty demanding, so she says, you know, she's got an ex, she's got an ex, uh, a presentation in real life to give. She'll say, I need an exhibit to do to show this, and so we we do things like that, and uh, we built comets and we built telescopes and we built all kinds of stuff, and um, also if you ever see Patio, ask her where she's sitting today because that's she always, she sits on everything. She's just crazy about that. Uh, exhibit maintenance. I'm going to try to wrap this up really quickly so I can show you some exhibits. The most thankless and frustrating job is finding out that an update broke your exhibit. And this happens all the time. So things that break are materials and collisions and impulses and vehicles and uh, stupid things like floating point rounding errors, which they've never fixed. So, and then in real life, this is no different because visitors always vandalize exhibits too. So you can automate this stuff. Um, I put in usually some scripts that periodically reset all the other scripts, which helps. Uh, periodically, you can make sure that anything that's movable gets set back to its original position. Um, verifying time, which is to take the time that you think is the time and resyncing it. And also check the SIM lag to make sure that your SIM doesn't need any attention. Um, also make sure time hasn't gone backwards, because that happens when SIM resets happen. And also you can monitor the region version number and find out if there's been an update. And sometimes when there's an update, it's a good thing, because they've added more LSL calls, and sometimes it's just a pain in the butt. So keep on top of those things. So some exhibits. I want to show you these. This Hopefully, they'll be evocative. And I, may, maybe you've all gone to The Sims, you know, to slow and stuff, but um, maybe not. So the first thing I wanted to show you was this was the very first exhibit I ever built. And here I'm thinking inside the slow. So you notice we've got some things on the side, which don't allow people on the side to see very well. This is simultaneous contrast. And my goal was to make it in three dimensions. And uh, you'll see a touch for the note card to get the uh, actual what is going on here thing. And uh, if you touch and start, you can see that things change in, in contrast. But the center pegs on, on the dominoes are all staying the same color. 
And uh, I did a lot of things wrong with this exhibit. First of all, it's too fast. Uh, it wasn't, but then everything got converted to mono, so things sped up. And also, um, uh, I should have made it bigger. Anyway, it was a good first exhibit, though. I thought so, at least. Um, I'll show you. Let's see. Okay, so this is something that you see in almost every exhibit, every museum that you'll ever find. Everybody loves the cafe wall. And in the Exploratorium, the cafe wall, which is an illusion, is uh, actually was in the original Exploratorium Museum, was the uh, wall outside of the bathrooms. <laughs> um, but originally the cafe wall was in a cafe out at some place in Great Britain. But you'll notice that it, everything doesn't look straight. But when I build it, I want people to be able to find out what's going on. And so when you click it and the different tiles change position, you can see everything is straight. And then when it goes back, which it will sort of, I hope, or I can click it, it will you can see now the illusion takes place, and so you can play with this for hours, and it's fun. But you can see the illusion really works, and at the same time, we've introduced the uh, element of interactivity, and this to me makes it so much better than just having a straight wall that you can never change. And believe it or not, um, you can build this in a regular museum just by having your tiles on movable, um, you know, pieces of wood that you pull back and forth with dials. So that works pretty well. And uh, there's a museum in Spain that took my exhibit and built it there. So I kind of felt really good, cool about that. Uh, let's see what's next here. Oh, well, we can take that one more step, which is the rotating cafe wall illusion. So, um, the Tom Titz Museum in Sweden built this so that it was rotating. You might have to zoom in to get the, the, the uh, cylinders to smooth out. That's uh, the second line problem. And they had this rotating around. They thought they were really clever, but here's the problem. You can't really ever tell that it's anything but just, you, you, you don't know that it's not just the texture. But see, in Second Life, what you can do is click on it, and then all the layers come apart and expand. And now you can see how nothing's changed other than you've moved them a little bit apart so that you can see that, in fact, they are all square. But then when they collapse back down, the illusion happens again. And this is brilliant. Um, and there's no way um, that I, that it, I mean, a museum actually could do this. You could do this with some pneumatics and some, just raise up the individual layers of the cake, like a, a layer cake. Um, but nobody's built it yet in real life, although the Exploratorium is working on it, because I think it's brilliant. And I keep asking for money to do that. Okay, let's see. Ah, here's a really good one. This is a Pi Day thing. And um, believe it or not, you can go buy one of these or I'll give one to you. But um, for Pi Day, you know, everything's about puns. And so we have this clock called Splow Time. But in fe instead of, uh, you know, keeping track of time, uh, you basically are looking at things that are in terms of pi radians. So it's kind of fun, you know, build some stuff, it works. And uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So uh, let's see, what else we got here? How are we doing on time? We got about three minutes. I want to show, uh, let's see, did I do the gravity ball reser yet? Uh, no, I don't think I did. This is one of my favorite exhibits, only because I really think it's uh, it shows off a lot of what is really good about Second Life. Um, and here we can click on a planet and pick a ball to, and just let it drop. And we get some telemetry and chat. 
and it tells you everything you need to know. And then you can go down here to Saturn, for example, and um, drop the ball, and you've got some telemetry for Saturn. Um, and then if you go to, I guess, I think it's Uranus, could be Neptune though, and you look at, and no, it's got to be, it's probably Neptune. Yeah, it's probably Neptune. And um, you'll notice that the time in Neptune and the time in Saturn are pretty much almost exactly the same. And that's because, you know, they have uh, Saturn is a gas giant and Neptune is an iron core and, you know, mass and gravity and all that stuff. So it's really evocative and you can play with this and learn some stuff. And this is a really perfect exhibit for Second Life. And, uh, oops, I'm going to take that, because, there we go. And, uh, let's see, one other thing. Oh, I wanted to do the earthquake one, and I'm not going to have time, otherwise I'm going to cut somebody off. So I'm going to do one more quick one, and this one is for fun. And this is... And we actually built this in, in real life, by the way, but I did it first in Second Life. And then we went out and got a 40-liter wine bottle and filled it full of Coke. So, uh, uh, and then we pressurized it, actually. We had to put a, we actually had to, to drill through the glass and make a, a way to pump it up with extra, extra gas. But... Mentos and Coke. Doesn't get any better than that. Whoops. Now I gotta delete all those individually. Dumb. Okay. So, for the most part, that's, uh, that's what I got. Oh, I did want to do one other thing, and that is I want to introduce you to the greatest physical thing in Second Life. Uh, other than, by the way, my partner, Becca Vachon, over there, we've been together for a long time, uh, and uh, she's actually my greatest joy in Second Life, but in terms of physics, let's see, where the heck did you go? Here we go. adorable. <laughs> and Jing has a, this is Jing Sen, and she is my puppy, and she has a sister. In fact, Becca has uh, Jing's sister, uh, Mo uh, Shu. Uh, Jing Shen means uh, magician, uh, I'm sorry, charmer. No, magician, sorry, in Chinese. And uh, so uh, that's how Jing is, but Jing also can do th other things that a lot of dogs in Second Life um, can't. So um, she has one message to tell you all before we leave. And she loves you, and I love you too. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> and uh, I can, uh, if you have any questions or you need any other information, um, just, uh, you can, uh, send me this, uh, I am, and we can touch base. Thank you very much, and I'll turn over to...